Nitya, and welcome to all of you who are joining from across the United States and indeed across the globe. I am coming to you from Los Angeles, California, and my colleague General Chaturvedi right at this time is in New Delhi. So we have a truly global webinar here. For ease of, uh, of uh, uh, processing here on the webinar, I will be the primary speaker. Uh, General Chaturvedi and I have prepared the content together very carefully and he will take on questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. Feel free to send us questions along the way and uh, we will address them at, uh, at the end of the webinar. We've got plenty of material to cover, so I'll jump right in. And uh, I'd like to start my presentations with a quote from the former ambassador to India, John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, Professor Galbraith from Harvard was, was really an Indophile and loved India. And when he spoke about India as a functioning anarchy, he meant it very affectionately. Uh, in fact, once he completed his tenure as ambassador, uh, Galbraith came back to India several times. And I would say that from the 1960s, when, when he was President Kennedy's ambassador, to now the one difference is that uh, there's more emphasis on functioning than anarchy. But, but you will still find that India works in manners that are confusing to most Western executives. Fast forward to, to, uh, to 2010, and last month, as Supriya mentioned, I was part of uh, President Obama's executive uh, mission to India. Uh, we started in Mumbai, and in Mumbai, the meetings were all about business. At the Trident Hotel in South Mumbai, uh, the top leadership of Indian companies got together along with the U.S. India Business Council and the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce. And uh, the, the uh, president announced about $10 billion in, uh, in, in deals relating to uh, American exports to India. Uh, there were two principal uh, parts of that announcement that had to do with, uh, with, with aerospace. Uh, Right here in Long Beach, California, where I live, uh, Boeing manufactures the C-17 Globemaster III aircraft, and there's a substantial order for those coming, as well as uh, uh, 99 engines uh, produced by General Electric that will go into India's light combat aircraft over the next several years. But President Obama also announced uh, that he intends to liberalize the export controls that have limited many defense companies in doing business with India. And shortly after that, uh, the Indian media released the news that the U.S. government was shortening the list of Indian organizations placed on the Bureau of Industrial Securities entities list and pretty much eliminating all defense-related organizations from that list. So this includes the Defense Research and Development Organization. It includes the Indian government company Bharat Dynamics that produces missiles, and it also included several parts of the Indian Space Research Organization. The only people left on the, uh, the entities list have to do with India's nuclear weapons program, and we don't expect those to be removed anytime soon. On, uh, the, on, on the, this all happened on, on Saturday uh, in Mumbai. On Monday, when President Obama addressed the parliament in New Delhi, he made an announcement that uh, India had waited for for a while, and that is that he declared the United States support for India joining the UN Security Council on a permanent basis. India is a temporary member of the Security Council this year, but has always had the desire to be a permanent member. Now, this isn't going to happen anytime soon, but four of the five members of the Security Council have now expressed support for this, uh, and, and only China has not. So this was a very significant move uh, seen uh, by Indians as developing friendship between the two countries and uh, developing alignment. For those of you who might not be familiar with India, here's a, a one, one, one slight snapshot. India's gross domestic product is now about $1.1 trillion, and it is the second most populous country in the world after China. Its population will actually exceed China's in the next 20 years. But it's always been a free market economy. In Asia, India has the oldest stock market that was actually created by the British when they ruled India in 1875. You will 
care about India's riches and the 52 billionaires that have risen uh, in, 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 in the wealth rankings over the last decade. But when you do business in India, be aware that 70% of India's population makes less than $2 a day. And the elected officials who run India have to be very conscious of making sure that these 700 million people and their needs and their aspirations are addressed. So when things happen in India that look counterintuitive or strange, understand that it's not all about the large corporations and about, about the West. It's really about serving the 700 million people that, uh, that vote to elect the government that, that you are dealing with. The U.S.-India relationship has gone through a tremendous transformation. And President Obama has used the term defining partnership of the 21st century when he refers to, to, the, to the burgeoning U.S.-India relationship. And this is quite remarkable because only in 1998, when India conducted its last nuclear test, the United States under President Clinton had declared sanctions pretty much barring India from importing any kind of Western technology that had to do with defense or nuclear. And so there's been a tremendous transformation. There are many reasons for it. We don't, uh, we are not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. I've got some uh, overall factors listed here relating to the growing alignment. You also see a picture at the bottom. This is the Defense Minister A.K. Antony uh, visiting uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton in uh, in September this year uh, in preparation for uh, uh, President Obama's visit to India. And on the right is the U.S. Ambassador, the Indian Ambassador to the United States, Amira Shankar. Let me tell you very briefly about Amrit. Uh, we are not going to do a sales pitch at all in this, in this uh, webinar, but just so you know where we are coming from. Amrit is an American company, and we are management consultants helping to accelerate trade and business between the West and India. 90% of our clients are American companies, about 10% are European. And we have several focus areas. I'm talking to you today about our defense and aerospace practice, where we offer a number of services that are listed here in terms of market access, in terms of supply chain, in terms of executive coaching, guidance, and training, as Supriya mentioned. And then in terms of helping you staff up your company in India. Some of the people who lead our, our defense practice are listed here. Uh, we couldn't have them all on the webinar today, but Dr. Russ Turner used to run a $6 billion business unit for Honeywell's aerospace engines business. And prior to that, he ran Rocketdyne at the time of its acquisition by Boeing. Uh, on the Indian side, of course, we have on this call uh, Major General Chaturvedi and uh, the, the other senior uh, defense official retired on the Indian side is Air Vice Marshal Rajinder Mohan. He was the top uh, uh, acquisition officer for the Indian Air Force. Uh, Supriya has already given you my background. And the picture on the right is the Aerospace Industries Association trade mission that went to India uh, a few years ago. Uh, we took a side trip to the Taj Mahal. And in that picture, you can see some of the senior executives from Raytheon, from, from Boeing, and from United Technologies. So, Priya, is this a good time to run a, a poll? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll go ahead and run the first poll. Everyone, please take a moment and answer the poll. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share the results. Sophia, can you read out the results because I don't see them. Oh, okay. Uh, so we have, so the question was, uh, what is your business unit status in selling to India? And 43% uh, um, have said that they have responded to RFPs or one business. 7% are working on a response to a first RFP. 
7% have received an RFI, but no RFP yet. 29% are exploring the India market, and 14% um, are in the other category. Terrific, Supriya. Thank you. Uh, so we, we see, as we run these webinars uh, several times a year, we are seeing a change in the mix of our attendees, and more and more we are finding that attendees who have had some engagement in responding to the proposal process are participating in these webinars. And, and this, of course, is because India's acquisitions process is uh, the pipeline is broadening. It's also because when people do encounter the first uh, RFPs, they find themselves confused and they find themselves having more questions than answers. And, 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 and we find often that, uh, that they come to, come to us for advice and guidance. So this is no surprise. Uh, are, are the polls uh, closed? Are we back on the slides? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, terrific. So you should see in front of you uh, a summary of India's defense budget. I do want to point out that India spells defense in the British way. And so when you travel to India, it would be a good idea to use Indian spelling rather than American spelling. That will show that uh, you're reaching out to, you know, to, to the way that India functions. In, in India, when they declare the budget, they don't even call it a budget. In, in, in government parlance, it is known as defense service estimate. And you can see that, uh, that India spends about 2.5% of its GDP. But I'm going to quickly run through some other slides. So you will see that the defense expenditure has been rising. Both the capital portion shown in red and the revenue, which is the non-capital or expense, as we would call it in this country, is also rising. Uh, there was a big spike last year when they raised the budgets quite a bit. And then this year, the budget, when it came out, uh, was only slightly higher than last year. So this is the good news. There's plenty of money in India today. And the Indian government is not afraid to spend it. Um, this here describes the difference between revenue and capital. I won't dwell on it. Let's move on. Uh, you can see that the, the allocation between capital and the services is shown here. Uh, about 12 billion is specifically mentioned as capital expenditure. And of the non-capital expenditure, the vast majority, the largest chunk it goes to the Indian Army. There's one, over 1 million people in the Indian Army, so it's not surprising that they, they take the largest chunk. The Air Force and Navy and the Coast Guard are far smaller. Money is not so much of an issue as you as as you see. The Indian Finance Ministry has said that India has more money available in case they get an acquisition plan ready faster than the budget this year or any year would allow. Problem really comes about in the utilization of the capital expenditure. India's defense procurement procedures are are somewhat onerous, and there is a great degree of caution in being wanting to be transparent and fair and, and above board. And that has often, in recent years, slowed down the way that India can spend money. So this graph from the IDSA actually shows the underutilization, uh, both percentage and absolute amounts. And you can see that the underutilization is increasing. And this is really the bottleneck in India, not, not, not the amount of money, but how can they find a way to actually spend it fast enough. The, uh, the other thing you should know is that India's trend in relative to GDP has changed last year. And now they are back to about the levels they were at in the 2005 time frame. The absolute amounts have been going up. They just weren't going up uh, in uh, commensurate with the growth of India's GDP. And the events of the last couple of years uh, with the security threats and so on have confirmed that India does want to keep up its, its uh, defense plan. This simply shows the uh, size of the, uh, the uh, uh, defense services expenditure. As I mentioned earlier, the Army is the largest chunk, and the others are uh, really the Air Force, uh, the Navy, and, and, and the, uh, the ordnance factories uh, take up a smaller chunk. There's a whole series of defense opportunities. I'm not going to read them to you or go through them one by one. Uh, many of these are fairly advanced, uh, are, are close to uh, close to completion. The 126 uh, uh, 
uh, multi-role combat aircraft, for example. Uh, the field trials have been completed, and uh, Air Marshal Nayak was uh, quoted in an interview just uh, just a few weeks ago, saying that we expect the process to be complete in early uh, 2011. Uh, I suspect that it may take a little bit longer than that for the final order to be released. Uh, but in the pipeline is something even bigger than that, listed on the second line here. Uh, India released an RFI, which some of you received from us, uh, relating to their Project 75I, which will be $11 billion for six submarines. And the list goes on and on. All the services, Army, Air, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, as well as the paramilitary, have significant needs. So uh, if there's something you make, there's a chance that the Indian uh, Indian armed services have a need for it. Now, how does India acquire some of this? When India became independent in 1947, they inherited working hardware from the British. And at that time, the idea was that they would buy pretty much everything government to government. This began changing in the 1990s, uh, at which time India was very much allied and aligned with the Soviet Union. As the Soviet Union began to break up, they realized that a more formal procedure was needed because India needed to start buying things from multiple sources. And the first defense procurement procedure was laid down in 1992. A few years later, India decided to open up to its own private sector because most defense manufacturing in India was run by government-owned companies. Now, this has been more of a theoretical exercise than a practical exercise because the amount of purchase from Indian private sector companies, even in 2010, is fairly small. But they have made some, some, uh, some moves over the years uh, in, in terms of inviting foreign direct investment. In 2000, they decided to open it up. And a few companies, mostly from Europe and Israel, and of course Russia, formed some, some uh, partnerships that, uh, that got things going. Uh, the defense procurement procedure has been substantially updated. And in 2005, uh, the government of India decided to post the actual procedure itself on the MOD website. So it's a public procedure. There's no secrecy about the document itself. Uh, you can go to the website right now and find both the defense procurement procedure, which covers capital purchases, as well as the defense procurement manual, which covers non-capital purchases. As you heard earlier, uh, General Chaturvedi was involved in a substantial portion of the update to this document that happened in 2008. Uh, I've described some of the changes there relating to offset credits and to uh, the theoretical raising of the foreign direct investment limit to 49%, although very few uh, pro proposals have been approved at 49%. Uh, British Aerospace uh, wanted to do a 49% deal with uh, Mahindra, and the government turned that down. I think it was finally approved at 26%, and it's a fairly small venture. Now, as you think about India uh, and uh, how to find an opportunity. If you are in business development or if you are part of the capture team, uh, you will realize very quickly that identifying the opportunities in India is definitely complex. This is starting to change. The intent of the Indian Ministry of Defense, uh, repeated consistently by the top leadership, is that they want the process to be transparent. They want, they want it to be transparent so they get multiple bidders so that there isn't a cloud of suspicion hanging over how the money was spent, and so that, so that uh, the best possible providers can have a chance of winning the business. Now, the way that procurement is planned and strategized is really there, there are three levels of planning. The long-term integrated procurement plan, or the LTIPP, is a 15-year look ahead as to what are the needs and platforms that the Indian military should have over, over a decade and a half. And then that's converted to something that is more pragmatic and practical called the Services Capital Acquisition Plan, divided by each of the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. Uh, and that, that kind of governs their, their operational needs. And then finally, there is an annual acquisition plan, or the AAP, 
that governs what happens on a month by month basis. Now, how do you, most of these documents are classified, although certain flavors of those are made available in, uh, you know, to, to, to limited audiences, and we can give you some insight into how these, uh, uh, these plans might be progressing. But the best way to get uh, opportunity uh, identification for your own company is through face-to-face -face meetings. And these meetings will typically be at the Ministry of Defense in South Block, which is pictured on the top uh, photo here, or at the Army Navy, Head, uh, Army, Navy Air Force or uh, Coast Guard headquarters, all of which are located in the central capital complex uh, within a very short drive of, uh, of South Block. Uh, you typically won't be spending a lot of time with uh, with mid-level or junior uh, officials who are typically not allowed to meet representatives of foreign companies. I think they have a rule that you've got to be above a certain rank before you can have a meeting with a foreign citizen. And all of those meetings have to be cleared in advance. So there's a whole process you have to go through. They run a security clearance and a check on every single meeting. The time and the date of the meeting is approved. You can't change a meeting from the morning to the afternoon just because something came up. It has to go back for clearance if, if, if you need to make a change like that. So there's quite a bit of planning involved in setting up these meetings. The other way is that you can exhibit at some of the, some of the uh, trade shows. Every other year, India holds the Aero India show in Bangalore. It's coming up in February 2011. And then in, uh, in years where they don't have Aero India, they hold the Defense Expo at Pragati Maidan in New Delhi, which is typically held in January or February. Theoretically, you should be able to find RFPs posted on this website I've listed here, but we find that the Ministry of Defense is, is very limited in terms of what they
Gunjun, can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Uh, we seem to be experiencing some audio difficulties. We are trying to resolve the issue. Please hold on. Thank you. Hello. There seems to be some difficulties with audio, and I have dialed back in. I hope people can hear me better now. Um, what I was saying is that uh, proposals uh, need to address some of the differences between the cultural ways of doing business in India uh, compared to the West. Many of these have to do with the use of the English language and the style. It also needs to have a factor relating to how the Western company is going to integrate with the Indian ecosystem. Often this means finding local partnerships if it's appropriate, but there can be many other factors relating to this. And these are things that, uh, that you should be aware of when you, when you take your business to India. Here is a quick outline of the procurement process. India follows a system where they require you to submit both a technical bid and a commercial bid at the same time. They do not open the commercial bid when they start. So the gray boxes become active first. The technical proposals are opened. They conduct a paper technical evaluation and disqualify anybody whose proposal did not meet the requirements listed in the RFP. They then conduct field trials of those that qualify. And after the field trials, there is a evaluation process that determines whether the uh, people who pass the field trials will be accepted. Only at that point are the commercial proposals opened, and they are open only for those that made, through, made it through this qualification process. At that point, theoretically, uh, the L1 process takes over, and you uh, you win the business if you are the lowest bidder. There are no extra points for exceeding the requirement. And uh, once that happens, uh, they go into the negotiation process for the final contract. Now, there are many slips and hiccups along the way in many of the proposals. The Indian government reserves the right to restart the process at any time. They reserve the right to cancel the entire procurement, and they reserve the right to to modify it or accelerate it uh, because of national uh, national priorities or emergencies or, or, or any other consideration. So uh, this process is working itself through for many, many acquisitions. And it's starting to get more stable. Uh, but uh, there are many purchases that do happen that, uh, that may not involve competitive bidding. Uh, so you should be aware of that possibility as well. Uh, let's move very quickly to talk about India's defense offset policy. Uh, India didn't have an offset plan until until just a few years ago. And when they created one in 2005, they also created a new agency called DOFA, or the Defense Offset Facilitation Agency. Now, it's important to understand that in India, the mission is to increase defense production capability. They are not looking for offsets to create jobs. They're not looking for offsets to sell. We today India imports 70 percent of its defense needs, and they want that to drop to 30 percent. So keep that in mind as you think about Indian offsets. The general principle today is that for purchases over 66 million dollars. India will typically have a 30% offset requirement for the category where they are buying from overseas. Uh, the, they reserve the right to modify this. So for the MRCA, the $10 billion MRCA, uh, they requested a 50% offset. Uh, there is some limited, uh, uh, limited uh, ability to get credits. Uh, but they own the credits uh, that you earn in advance uh, hold true only for about two years. And they can be direct credits on a particular program, or they can be indirect offset credits relating to the defense industry. All offsets have to apply to the defense industry. You don't, uh, you can't have a civilian offset or an offset that is outside of defense capabilities. And India today, recognizes offsets on a $1 to $1 basis. 
there are no multipliers and we don't expect India to have multipliers anytime soon. So why do people come to us? Uh, you know that India really doesn't permit agents and we at Amrit do not f function as agents. We are advisors and consultants and educators. And why do people come to us? They come to us really because India confuses most Western companies. There are many, many levels of that confusion and I could spend an entire hour talking about it. Most American companies are used to the American way of functioning in Washington where you have lobbying and you work with the defense subcommittees at the Senate and the House, uh, you, uh, you uh, get yourself on the budget, you try and, uh, you try and uh, get the attention of certain legislators who are seen to be powerful or influential. Uh, many of those methods don't really translate into India. The other thing you have to be aware of is that today 90% of India's hardware is of Russian origin or Soviet origin. And that's not going to change anytime soon. In fact, uh, India recently announced uh, the joint development of the fifth generation fighter aircraft, which could be a 20 or $25 billion initiative uh, with the Russians. And this happened after Defense Minister Anthony visited Washington and before President Obama arrived in India. Uh, this week, as we speak, in fact, the French President Nicolas Sarkozy and his wife Carla Bruni are in India. The French have been supplying the Scorpion submarines they are looking for uh, for a deal to upgrade the Mirage aircraft. Uh, they are also bidding on the MRCA. So there are many competitors looking for the business from uh, from uh, the Ministry of Defense. And so you have to recognize that you are going to face a situation where uh, you have to compete vigorously to win. Many Western executives, when they visit India, get confused by the Indian tendency to be indirect or polite as, as the Indians view it. Uh, in India, you never call a spade a spade. In India, you often don't get a direct answer to a question. Now, this is just the way the culture functions, very similar perhaps to the Japanese or East Asian ways. Some Americans lead, uh, jump to the conclusion that the Indians are being deceptive or somehow uh, have a malicious intent. That's not really the case. And this is very important that you understand how to communicate with the Indians in this indirect manner and still be able to function. Be also ready that India will take some time. If you're looking for a quick win, don't waste your time, don't buy a ticket going to India, go sell to another country. There are huge markets and huge potentials in India, but it will take some time. If you're patient, you can, you can win quite a bit of business given India's situation today. So the key element in differentiating yourself revolves around a fuzzy concept called trust. Building trust in India is not easy. It takes time, it takes multiple visits, and it's very, very easy to jump to the wrong conclusion. So many clients come to us because they're looking to better understand how to build trust. Let me take this opportunity to conduct uh, one more poll here, just so we can understand the audience. So tell us if you are looking to do business with the Air Force, the Army, or the Navy. And we realize some of these questions are difficult to answer because you may you may have an intent when working with multiple of the services. Most of you have finished voting, so I am going to close the poll momentarily. Share the results. So we see that uh, about 40% of you are thinking about the Indian Air Force, and then there's a, a equal split between the Army and the Navy or Coast Guard. And then 24% of you are thinking of other types of sales, uh, and I assume this has to do with civilian aerospace because we saw some of those questions coming through uh, by email, and I'll try to address those at the end. Um, but let's uh, let's move on. So 
So what is different about India? This, this is a question I get asked often. We, our company sells worldwide. What's the big deal? Why should I pay very specific attention to India? Well, there are many, many factors that are different. I've referred to some of them earlier relating to the, uh, you know, to the huge, uh, uh, huge uh, legacy of the Soviet supply. It began really in the, in, in the early 70s and lasted for 25 years and continues today. Uh, India is buying uh, an aircraft carrier. The, the, the former, the former Gorshkov is going to become India's largest, uh, uh, largest uh, aircraft carrier. It's an angle deck carrier, and there's been uh, quite a bit of controversy around it. But India is spending about two billion dollars uh, to to uh, to get it equipped, and uh, and it should arrive in India in a couple of years. Uh, when you build a company in India, you will find that. There are many specific factors to consider. India's labor laws are very different. The way Indian manufacturing runs, particularly small unit manufacturing, is quite different. There is considerable uh, availability of high quality, low volume manufacturing that is suited for aerospace, but it is a moving target, and uh, and and we find that uh, that it is well worthwhile to engage with some of those companies. Uh, but keep in mind that for most of those employers, it's very hard for them to fire uh, employees. So the, the American way of working where you can adjust your workforce depending on the size of the income inbound contract is, is a little harder to implement in India. And uh, so you have to be aware that your manufacturing partners in India will be concerned about such factors. And then when you turn around and you look at the public sector undertakings or PSUs run by the Indian government, Many of them run by the Indian Ministry of Defense, such as uh, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, HAL, Bharat Electronics Limited, BEL. These are vast, vast companies where it's practically impossible to, to reduce the size of staff. Uh, the people who join these companies pretty much spend their entire lives and careers there and have a job for life. Uh, they have locations throughout the country, and they are very firmly entrenched in the Indian ecosystem. You also need to be aware of the elite government service called the IAS. We don't have time to cover that in today's uh, uh, very brief webinar, but it's uh, it's something that uh, that we do educate our clients quite a bit about. Most of the most of the senior government officials that you will meet outside of the elected uh, outside of the elected officials will be members of the IAS, and they have tremendous influence and power over the acquisition decision, both from the uh, defense side as well as from the finance side. American companies, of course, have to be conscious of of, of uh, the U.S. laws that apply to uh, to, to their operations. Sarbanes Oxley, the the uh, ITAR specifications, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, their own ethics codes, uh, the ability to get licenses from the Department of Commerce, and all of these, until recently, were foreign concepts, literally and figuratively, to India. So uh, the, the, the Indian acquisition uh, staff really couldn't understand why, you, why an American company couldn't guarantee that they could provide a product. Uh, they really want to, they, they would say, get, get your export clearances and all of that before you come talk to us. So the process, as you know, in, in the US is not that straightforward and simple. It becomes a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. I am hopeful that with President Obama's visit, that the understanding in state and commerce will be much clearer that this is about American jobs and it's about building and, and reinforcing the alliance between the two countries. And so these issues should not hold back American companies as much as they have in the past. But I can assure you they'll continue to be factors that need to be dealt with, especially when you compare yourselves with your you know, French, Italian, Russian uh, colleagues uh, who are trying to sell to the Indian market. There are softer factors that we spend quite a bit of time around uh, relating to developing relationships as opposed to legal agreements uh, about the use of the English language. I wrote an article some years ago that, uh, that became quite celebrated. I entitled it Divided by a Common Language, and I'm happy to send a copy to anyone on this call who requests one. Uh, let's see if we can conduct our final poll here. As you think about India, what is your biggest challenge when you when you want to do business in India?
Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to encourage everyone to please send in your questions. We have a couple of questions already. Uh, and the more questions you can send us using the question pane, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. We're all getting very good at doing the polls. I'm going to close them and share the results. So we, we have dealing with the Indian bureaucracy as being the biggest challenge. This is very interesting to me because two years ago when we were conducting these polls, it was very common that during our webinars, people would say, getting attention inside my own company is my biggest challenge. We used to find that there were a few people who were converts to the Indian opportunity, and they were fighting internal battles. Looks like those battles have been won. Looks like uh, the, you know, and we have a very large number of people attending this webinar today. It looks like most of you have, uh, have uh, convinced your internal management that India is worth paying attention, and now you are having to deal with uh, the next layer of the onion, which is uh, dealing with the Indian bureaucracy. I can promise you that uh, in addition to this, you will find uh, that uh, once, you, uh, once you begin to approach the government for export licenses, that uh, despite, uh, despite uh, the uh, president's uh, declared intent and the Secretary of Commerce's uh, 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 confirmation that the Indian market is important. There will still be some procedural hurdles in getting some of those export licenses. At least that's what our clients are reporting even after the Obama visit. I'm hopeful that that thing will get start to get better, but uh, but keep that in mind as well. So how how do you move forward uh, going you know to 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 engage with India? There is support available from the American Embassy in India. There are some very hardworking people, many of whom I have met. In fact, some of them whom I met last month, uh, the defense attaches, the, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce people uh, based in New Delhi and other cities are uh, looking out for you, uh, and they are promoting the Indian cause. Uh, uh, the ambassador, Tim Romer, is committed to building the relationship, both uh, political, cultural, and business. Uh, you may want to, to turn to advise third-party advisors, such as Amrit. Uh, keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that you can't really have a commissioned agent in India. Uh, there is a law that allows agents, but its, its requirements are so onerous and so restrictive that no, no real companies have registered to become legal commissioned agents in India. And so that, that avenue is pretty much unavailable to Western companies. So one of the things you have to decide as you are starting to answer RFPs is uh, are you selling the right products in India? Are you, are you uh, uh, ready for a presence on the ground in India? Some of the large companies have already done that. Boeing has a substantial office in India, and many of the other large primes have, have small offices. But typically, even then, they need support from the US side, and there's quite a bit of communication back and forth. And that's where we often get involved in uh, in uh, helping people with uh, their success plans in India. We are coming to the end of the webinar. Uh, Supriya, can we hear you? Ah, uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Ganjan? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. So, uh, <laughs> go ahead and uh, take a look at the questions. Ah, uh, sure. Uh, we have a few questions, and again, um, everyone, you can feel free to um, send in your questions using the question box, and we will answer them in the order received. Um, the first question we have is, um, is there an update to the defense procurement policy forthcoming? What changes can we expect, and when might we see the new policy? Do I take that on, uh, Gunjan? Yes, General Chaturvedi, please go ahead. Uh, a few months ago, uh, the uh, defense minister, Mr. Anthony, had announced that we will uh, start reviewing the defense procurement procedure annually hereafter, which was being done on an uh, alternate year basis. Uh, so what Gunjan had mentioned was that the uh, DPP 2008 had been made, and uh, this was subsequently amended in uh, 
2009 September. Uh, another uh, DPP 2010 or modifications to the earlier DPP was expected in September this year. Uh, the work is going on for various reasons. It has got uh, a slightly delayed. So I guess uh, it should take another about month to two months before uh, the revised uh, defense procurement procedure is put into the public domain. Uh, however, uh, as I visualize, uh, there may not be very significant changes, but yet uh, we can look forward to some very exciting changes uh, both uh, for the foreign companies as well as the Indian private sector. Uh, more on it, uh, perhaps uh, we could analyze once they are in the public domain. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, great. Thank you so much, General Chaturvedi. Okay. Um, the next one, uh, which also is probably for General Chaturvedi, is uh, how are offsets working out in India today? What can a Western company expect going forward? Okay. Uh, Offsets is uh, a little tricky uh, at the moment uh, in the sense that uh, while the Defense Offset Facilitation Agency that is DOFA has been created, uh, it is uh, perhaps uh, yet not uh, uh, fully equipped to deal with this uh, uh, huge amount of offsets and banking etc. that is likely to come up and that uh, process of strengthening DOFA is uh, going on. Uh, however, in the meanwhile, uh, there are uh, various uh, industry uh, confederations like the Confederation of uh, Indian Industry and in the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry and also uh, some uh, agencies in the private sector like uh, the Tata Industrial Services and uh, maybe uh, I think Amrit is also fairly well placed uh, to assist any Western companies uh, who may be interested in uh, finding out uh, offset partners in India and how, about, and how to go about uh, meeting their offset obligations for a particular project. So it's in a Still a process which is uh, not fully matured, having been introduced only in 2005-06. So, but yes, it is going on like uh, Gunjan mentioned, the MRCA has a 50% uh, component of offsets, which is a fairly huge uh, amount. So yes, it's going on and the capacity in the private uh, sector is building up. So I suppose uh, a uh, couple of years, uh, things may be more encouraging than what they are today. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question here from Denise, who says that all, all of their company's sales have been through HAL, and she wants to know if the Indian Ministry of Defense sources direct, as, as well as through government integrators such as HAL. Uh, do you want to answer that, General Chaturvedi? Yes, uh, uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense uh, sources through both these agencies. Uh, it uh, procures directly, to, which is governed by the Defense Procurement Procedure. And uh, the defense uh, public sector undertakings that Gunjan mentioned have their own uh, procedures and uh, they also source directly. Similarly, the uh, Defense uh, Research and Development Organization, the RDO that is, it also operates under a separate set of procedures and also uh, goes in for uh, research tie-ups with uh, foreign entities. Uh, so yes, uh, there are different uh, pathways uh, leading into the acquisition either of technology or uh, finished products in India. Mm. And they're quite, they may be substantially different one from the other at times. Absolutely. And I would add to that what I alluded earlier relating to the paramilitary organizations, the, uh, you know, the, the border security force, the Indian Tibetan border police, 
uh, in, in many of the other security agencies that are part of the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs. Uh, in some of them are what we refer to in the U.S. as Homeland Security. They 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 form a separate source of uh, of acquisition. So it's uh, the the landscape is fairly widespread and complex, uh, depending on the kind types of products or services that you or your company might have. Uh, we have another question here from Mike relating to FDI, and he says, "Do you know of any FDI ventures that have been approved?" by the Indian Ministry of Defense at 49%. Uh, I don't know, General Chaturvedi, if you want to take that on. I do know that the BrahMos, the collaboration to build missiles between Russia and India is, is at 49% uh, between, you know, 49, 50% between Russia and India, but it's, it's between the Indian Ministry of Defense and I believe the Russian company so it's a government-to-company type of relationship. Uh, are you aware of any others? Uh, I thought uh, I may be wrong, though. Uh, I thought Brahmos was at a 50-50 level. Uh, there was an equal... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it may be 50-50, but uh, my question is basically, yeah, yeah, has yeah. anybody crossed that 49 or has anybody approached that 49%? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I think uh, it is again the uh, the Russians and the Hindustan Aeronautical Limited, HAL that is, uh, who I think uh, uh, two or three months uh, back uh, have uh, reached an understanding where the uh, Russian FDI is 49% uh, uh, in the project which is being undertaken at HAL. I am not quite sure as to what the project really entails, but yes, there is a collaboration like this, where the uh, FDI is of 49 percent. But again, it is a company in the public sector uh, domain. Uh, I do not think, uh, or rather, I'm quite sure uh, that there is uh, no uh, foreign direct investment of this magnitude with any of the private sector undertaking so far. No, there Particularly is. those of Western origin. Uh, except this, uh, the one which I mentioned with the HL, I don't think there is any other except this. Okay, perfect. So Priya, do we have any more questions uh, to take yeah, care of? We actually have a couple of requests for um, uh, um, copies of the article that you mentioned and uh, for those folks I would uh, um, ask you to please send us an email at usa at amrit.com and uh, Gunjan or I will uh, uh, send you the, the requisite uh, article that uh, you know you are uh, requesting. Uh, we do have one last question uh, coming in uh, which is uh, defense has lagged behind other sectors when it comes to foreign companies investing in India. There is talk about some evolution in the foreign direct investment policy relating to defense in India. What is your view? Well, I think, you uh, want to take? Uh, the uh, FDI issue has been uh, being uh, hotly debated uh, in India for in the defense sector for uh, now about almost uh, six to eight months, uh, and. Uh, there have been uh, very strong arguments uh, which have been put forth uh, both for uh, enhancing it uh, from the present 26 percent uh, to 49 percent or 74 percent or even 200 uh, percent. There have also been equally strong arguments uh, against uh, raising the bar from 26 percent uh, maybe at the most going to 49 percent. Uh, but uh, at the end of it all, uh, the, there seems to be a fairly uh, divided house in the sense that the stakeholders like the Ministry of Defense, uh, the uh, industry uh, confederations like the CII or the uh, FICI uh, are not really in favor of uh, raising the FDI uh, levels more than the existing 26%. Uh, but notwithstanding that, I don't think any uh, final uh, decision uh, has been 
taken on it, the, still uh, it's in a kind of a melting pot uh, situation. Uh, I guess uh, it should, uh, by the end of the financial year, I guess, uh, which is uh, ends on the 31st of March, I guess something uh, should be there in the offering. Nobody knows exactly at the moment as to which way the tide is going to turn. So I, I think that is the, and in my personal view, uh, I think we need to be a little cautious. Uh, we need to analyze a lot of things, and I'm sure there are a lot of competent people doing that. Uh, but I don't think we are in a, we should be in a great hurry to uh, raise the FDI levels, uh, because I don't uh, see very, very extraordinary tangible benefits coming out of it. Uh, though of course there are lots of benefits. Uh, but uh, I think in the overall uh, picture, in my view, I think uh, the time is not yet uh, ripe uh, for it to be raised uh, significantly in any case. So that's it. Okay, terrific. Thank you. I think we are pretty much out of time, Supriya, so do you, you want to close out the webinar? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you so much, Gunjan, and thank you so much, uh, General Chaturvedi, for talking to our audience today. And th thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar this morning. We hope it was informative for you. If you have any additional questions, please do email us at usa at amrit.com. Again, that's usa at amritt.com. Please make sure, as you exit the webinar, that you answer a brief survey that is presented to you. We really appreciate your feedback and it helps us improve our webinars. If you have any friends or colleagues who you think might benefit from a similar webinar, please do have them register on our website, www.amrit.com, and we will notify them of any upcoming webinars. Thank you very much for attending today and have a nice day. Goodbye.